very grateful to be with all of you today. And very grateful for all of you for being here with us. Especially His Grace Truth Karma Ji Prabhu, who literally travels all over the world, colleges, universities, auditoriums, temples, and every other type of place, speaking on many subjects, but especially. He is very expert at dispelling illusions. Because material nature is created in such a way that things just aren't the way they appear to be. The word maya means that which is not. Now, some from this conception believe that the world doesn't exist. Maya means illusion, that which is not. Therefore, in the liberated state, we understand that this jagat, or this creation, it never existed, it never will exist, and doesn't exist now. It's just an illusion. But Ishopanishad tells, Om Purnam Adha Purnam Idam, Purnat Purnam Udachyate, that the Absolute Truth is perfect and complete. And all emanations of that Absolute Truth are also perfect and complete. Aham sarvasya prabhavam matha sarvam pravartate iti matva bhajante mam buddha bhava samanvita. The Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells, I am the source of all material and spiritual worlds. Everything emanates from me. So from this philosophical understanding, maya or illusion doesn't mean that the world doesn't exist, that the world itself is illusion. What is the illusion is the misconception. Just like if a person dreams that their about to be bit by a snake. Have you ever had a dream like this? <laughs> Were you just walking to the bath? You're having a dream that you're just waking up from bed and going to the toilet to respond to the very loud call of nature. <laughs> and on the way, there's a cobra with raised hoods <laughs> staring right in your eyes with his forked tongue slithering in and out and little fangs being revealed. Are you scared? <laughs> Yes, and then suddenly you wake up due to the actual call of nature. <laughs> and you're really afraid that that snake's there. So you turn on the light, there's no snakes, no cobras, nothing. And then you go to the bathroom and I'm not going to go into any details on this subject. <laughs> but you're relieved. It was an illusion. Now snakes do exist, and you do exist, 
and the calling of nature does exist. <laughs> but the illusion was you are identifying with that dream body. That does not exist. That is the illusion. So to see the sacredness of everything is to realize or understand that everything has a relationship with, with God, with the divine, with Krishna. Krishna tells in the Gita, for one who sees me everywhere and everything in me, for that person I'm never lost. Or is he ever lost to me? The illusion, according to Vaishna philosophy, is when we don't see anything's eternal connection to its divine source. Material nature is actually eternal. And all the elements with material existence, they don't die. They're just transformed into different appearances. Yes? This body, it doesn't cease to exist. At the time of death, the body, if you burn it, it turns into ashes. And then the ashes go somewhere. If you bury it, it becomes, depending on what kind of little insect is eating it, becomes that excrement after digested nicely. Or it becomes like dust. So the body is just transforming. So really, what is death? Death is just a transition. The elements of the body continue to exist. The water element merges into what the water. The earth element merges into earth. The fire element merges into fire. The, the air and the space elements enter into those elements. And the eternal soul, or the atma, is ever existing. It's not slain when the body's slain. So when we understand our eternal nature, and when we understand and appreciate how everything is ultimately emanating from the divine, from the supreme, then we can actually see things in truth. Misconception of appearances due to illusion is the cause of so much suffering and conflict. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, fifth canto, there's a wonderful story. This also took place a long time ago, according to Jutakarma's explanation. Such a long time ago that doesn't fit in the speculative conclusions of certain people who try to um, tell us what is creation and how everything is happening. But the difference is these great histories, these scriptures, have been accepted as truth and sources of enlightenment by the most compassionate, benevolent, realized, happy people that ever lived, continuously, through the ages. We read about the incredible histories of great saints here in India. They all fully accepted the knowledge of the Vedas. <coughs> the conclusions of the Vedas. And even Buddha, he may not have accepted the Vedas as, as a body of work, because so many people were misusing it, 
but practically his whole philosophy was teachings from the Vedas. The transmigration of the soul, the laws of karma, the mind, the ego. So are all these great personalities wrong? Are they all an illusion? Are they all just liars trying to get something out of us by telling us something different? No, these are people who actually are seeing reality, seeing the truth. So in this beautiful story, there was a great self-realized person. His name was Judd Bharat. And due to situations of his past, he had experiences of being caught up in ego, caught up in various types of gross and subtle attachments in this world due to relationships with others. So he decided he was going to pretend to be a complete fool. So no one would respect him. No one would give him any honor. In fact, people would just criticize him and reject him. And he wouldn't, have, he wouldn't get anything out of it materially. So this was his conception of living a very safe life. So when he was young at home, he would do everything the opposite. While we're on the subject of responding to nature, I'll continue in that <laughs> auspicious vein. Well, the system is, first you respond, yes, and then you wash yourself. That's the way our mothers teach us. Well, his mothers taught him that, but then he would wash himself, then respond. And that was the end of it. <laughs> they say, no, no, like this. And he would just keep doing it. He would pretend he wasn't able to learn. So his brothers thought he was so useless. They would make fun of him. They would beat him up. They would everything else. They didn't realize that he was a fully realized, he was a Jiva Mukta. He was a liberated soul. So they decided, what are we going to do with this person? So when the father died, they decided the only value he has in our family estate is to be a scarecrow. Yes? <laughs> so they just had him stand in the field to keep the crows away from the crops. And he did it. He was happy. He was meditating on the Lord within his heart. Then some Dacroids captured him. And they decided, because he was actually very young and very strong and very handsome, but he just looked so stupid. So they thought he will be a perfect human sacrifice for the goddess that they worshipped, goddess Kali. And they brought him and they gave him a bath. And he was just going along with whatever they said, because for him, birth, death, it's all illusion. And they put nice clothes on him and brought him to the sacrificial altar and anointed him with nice perfumes, and he was just <laughs> happily going along with destiny. Then it came for the pujari. He had a very sharp instrument that 
was designed to sever human heads. And he lifted it and was about to cut off Jad Bharat's head. And he was just, he was seeing, he knew exactly what was going on. Let it be. Mare Krishna Rake Ke Rake Krishna Mare Ke. If Krishna wants to save me, what can they do? If Krishna wants my head cut off, no problem. I'm remembering him, I'll attain perfection. Well, as he lifted the sword and was about to chop the head off, suddenly the deity of Kali grabbed the sword and cut the pujari's head off. <laughs> and all the Dacoites, too. It's, they, they worshipped her, and she did what was best for them. And then she very lovingly, like a mother, she made sure Jad Bharat was fine and nice. Then she became a deity again. And that deity is still there near Kurukshetra, Bhadragali, where that incident took place a long time ago. <laughs> and Jad Bharat just went into the forest and started walking around. <laughs> and a king named Rahugana was on procession in a palaquin. Because in those days, it wasn't cars or trains. It was palaquins. And there were four palaquin holders that were carrying the king along the road. And they came to a river. And one of the palaquin um, carriers was injured, so he couldn't go any longer. And you have to have four synchronized people to make a palaquin go because there's four handles on each side. So by the arrangement of destiny, they happened to see Jad Bharat walking around. So they grabbed him and said, the king needs a palaquin. You are a subject of the king. You carry the palaquin. So he was agreeable to do anything. Not the way people wanted it done, but <laughs> he had his way of doing things. So the, the king was in his royal garments with this very lavishly um, decorated palaquin. He was comfortably on his journey. But Jad Bharat, every three steps, he would stop and very carefully look to see if any ants were on the road because there was no possibility of him stepping on an ant. But the problem is none of the other three palaquin people were looking for ants. They couldn't care less about crushing little ants. But Jad Bharat, he was, a, he was really a follower of Ahimsa. Why? Because he was saying that there is a spirit soul in the heart wherever there's life. We often quote this verse from the Gita, Vidyavanaya Sampane, Brahmane Gavihastini, Suni Chaiva Sopake Chapandita Samadarshan. The one who is actually endowed with wisdom, who is learned and gentle, see every living being with equal vision, because they see a spark of, of God in everyone. The bodies are different, as Dhruta Karma Prabhu is explaining. There is evolution. There is the evolution of the soul through various species. It is not that the species are evolving one into another, it's the soul is evolving through these different species. So that soul that's giving life to an ant is identical to our own soul. It's a part of God. 
And it could be that in the next life, the ant is going to have a human body, and it could be that in the hum next life, I could be an ant. So Jad Parak was amani namana dena. He offered respect to everyone. Not because of some logical conception, but because he was actually seeing. He was seeing divinity in everything. There's no substitute for realization. Jnana Vijnana Triptatma. The Gita explains the whole purpose of theoretical knowledge is for Vigyan, realization. We could learn a hundred thousand slokas. We could be masters at logic, philosophy, debate. But if we don't have realization, direct experience of the subject, Shramayivahikevala, it's all useless. The whole purpose of knowledge is to bring us to the point of living our life in such a way that we gain realization. So as Jad Bharat stopped, every three steps or so, and everyone else kept going, the palaquin became very, very uncomfortable for the king. And sometimes it would actually be ants. So Jad Bharat wouldn't move until the ants crossed the road. And sometimes ants go in lines, if you see. <laughs> Last year I was in Melkote, and we were walking through a beautiful forest. He was crossing the road, and it was maybe about four inches wide. And I, I saw it. I wanted to trace how long it was. I went about 50 meters. And it was still going. And finally, I couldn't find the end of it. There were literally millions and millions and millions of ants in perfect line going to a particular place. I couldn't find the beginning or end of it. So, you know, John Barak may have also came across those kinds of ants. <laughs> and he was so strong, if he didn't move, nobody else could move. <laughs> and King Rahugana was so angry. He screamed at the chair at the palaquin holders. How dare you give me such an uncomfortable ride? Why are you doing this? Don't you know I am the king? You are my subjects. You will be punished for this. Now do it right. And all the other three, they said, yes, yes, yes. Then they were walking and Jad Bharat stopped again. An ant. You see, for Jad Parat, there was no difference between the king and an ant. <laughs> that was the problem. He was respecting God and everyone. So the king got really angry. And the other palaquin holders were petrified with fear because, you know, he's the king. He could punish us. He could kill us for, you know, it's just being so disrespectful to him. So they said, it's not us. We're doing everything right. It's him, this new guy. He just keeps stopping. Every few steps, he stops. We don't know why he stops. We're telling him, don't stop. But he, keep, he just you know, says, all right. And then he stops. <laughs> and the king looked at him and started speaking really sarcastic toward him. He said, you are 
is it because you are so old and you are so weak that you need rest every three steps? Is that why that, that's why you're stopping? Don't you know that you are my subject, you are the king, and I can punish you just like Yamaraj would punish? He was very angry. He challenged, who do you think you are? And Jad Parach, he's all alone in the middle of the forest, being chastised by the, by the king. And he looks up at him and smiles. And tells the king, you are in illusion. What you're saying is true. I'm neither strong or weak. I'm neither old or young. I'm the eternal soul. Not only that, I'm not even carrying this palaquin. It's only my body that's carrying this palaquin. And you, you are thinking you're the king, and you're thinking I'm your servant. But the eternal soul is transcendental to all of these physical designations. In next life, I may be the king, and you may be the servant. When the king heard this, he was deeply impressed. He was thinking, this person looks like such a stupid fool just out of the jungle, but he's speaking such high philosophy. He said, well, the king got down off of his palaquin and bowed down at the feet of Jad Bharat, the first person in Jad Bharat's life that ever respected him. <laughs> it was the king. Krishna tells in Gita that a self-realized soul, gold or pebbles, honor or dishonor, all of these dualities, they're just things we pass through. The real treasure is who we really are. The real treasure is Krishna that we are all eternal servants of God. And to serve, that's the treasure of life. Not to possess, but to serve. So, the king said, what you're saying is true, but it seems contradictory. Because you're saying that the soul is different than the body, and therefore the body is not affected by the soul. I mean, the soul is not affected by the situations of this world, in this body. But let's take, if you boil rice and milk. Yes? The rice is not the milk. The rice is separate from the milk. But when you boil milk, milk boils first. But because the rice is in the milk, the rice feels the heat, and it gets cooked. And another thing, you were saying that I'm the king now, it's only a temporary designation, but I'm not really the king, I'm an eternal soul, and you're a subject. But philosophically, you know, that may be true, but you have to be realistic, because philosophy contains dharma. And it's the dharma of the king to punish people, and it's the dharma of the king to reward people, and it's the dharma of the king to have subjects. So if we understand, it, 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 it's a contradiction. If I'm just thinking I'm the soul, then I won't be doing my duty to God or to the people as the king, nor will you as a subject. So, Jad Bharat explained that the knowledge of the relationship between the soul and God, the soul and this entire creation, and the soul and all other souls, both in the conditioned and liberated souls, that knowledge, that realization is inherent within all of us. It's simply, temporarily, co 
covered by the mind. And then he began to explain very scientifically the nature of the mind. When the mind is affected by the ego, then this, the Atma misconceives, I am this body. And this body has senses. And when we don't understand that the mind is meant to be under the direction of the soul, the mind comes under the direction of the body and the senses. Ananda Maya every living being is looking for pleasure because our nature is to experience the pleasure of Brahma, love of God. It's within us. It's our nature. It's our essence. It's who we are. It's who we've always been. But in the dreamlike state, the ego makes us think that forget our spiritual nature. We think we are this body. We are this mind. So we have to find pleasure in that forgetful state. And we look for it through the interaction between the senses and their objects. The Bhagavad Gita, in purport, it is explained by Prabhupada, the analogy of a chariot. The body is like a chariot. The senses are like five horses that are pulling the chariot. The mind is like the reins or the ropes that are meant to control the horses. So the chariot goes in the right direction. The intelligence is the chariot driver who uses the power of discrimination, gyan, to do the right thing. And the passenger is the atma, the soul. Now the chariot is supposed to go where the passenger wants the chariot to go. But if the passenger is just forced to go along with wherever the horses want to go, we're not going to reach the right destination. So the soul is supposed to be in charge. But in a state where we've lost connection to the real desires of the soul, the Paramatma is within the heart too. God, who is the giver of direction. But when since time and memorial we forget our relationship with the Paramatma due to being subservient to the dictations of the mind and the senses, we don't know. But the Guru, the Sadhus, the Shastras, the scriptures, they are the external manifestations of this Paramatma who are telling us the needs of the soul. So a genuine guru, genuine sadhus, who are teaching the proper understanding of the scripture, they are giving us the guidance of our own soul that we're forgetful of. They're telling us what the Lord in the heart wants us to do, because we can't hear them. when it is actually in tune with our spiritual essence is the source of the greatest happiness and liberation. Jad Bharat said, there is only one enemy. Not people, not things. The only enemy in all creation is one's own uncontrolled mind. And the Gita says, for the mind that's controlled, it's the ultimate best friend. Because suhritam sarvadutanam, it's in line with our eternal friend, Krishna, Bhagavan. But the mind that is un uncontrolled is our greatest enemy. like a thief that steals away our treasures, 
our real treasures. We cannot judge things by their appearance. We have to understand things in relationship to who we really are and our relationship with God and our relationship with each other as pure spiritual beings. And Jad Bharat gave an example that a lantern, the mind is like the wick within a lantern. If the wick is being nourished by pure ghee, but if it's not right, if it's burning wrong, then what happens? It doesn't give off light. Rather, it makes the glass of the lantern black and obscures any light from coming out of it. That's like the mind that's under the dictation of the ego. But when the mind is under the, in line and harmony with the soul through Guru Sadhu Shastra, then the mind becomes like that wick that is burning and gives light everywhere, pure light. So all the problems we have are because of this mind's association or avidya, that which is not maya. Our tendency is, as Jutu Karma Prabhu was saying, we like to see things according to how they appear. In this regard, I'm going to tell a personal story, and then I'm going to get back to the Srimad Bhagavatam again, I hope. This happened a few years ago. It was a very, very instructive incident in my own life. I was in Italy. In a place called Prabhupada Desh. And we had about, I think about 200 devotees. And we were having a festival there. But at that time, there was a heat wave that broke all records. It was so hot. I don't know how in Celsius exactly what the temperature, but it was really hot, maybe 45 degrees or something. It's so hot that in the newspapers it showed there was drought. The price of vegetables, the price of grains was going right up because nothing could grow. Everything was being scorched by the sun. And every week people were dying of the heat. It was so hot that some of my friends told me that the Pope pleaded with all of his countrymen and all of his followers in Italy to pray to God to stop the heat wave. It was really hot. And when we come together, you know, we do kirtan. <laughs> so we were doing kirtan. We had one event in the city of Venice, Venezia. Venice is a beautiful place for hours and hours and hours in the heat of the day in the sun, there were 200 devotees doing kirtan and dancing. <laughs> and the night was no warmer than the day, I mean, no cooler than the day. So devotees were really, really ecstatically suffering. <laughs> Uh, 
they were ecstatic during the care time, being together, and all these people were you know, dancing with us, and everything was so nice, people were appreciating, but the heat was so oppressive. So we decided, after the kirtan, and also we were doing for so many hours, devotees were really hungry. We were going to take a boat, a ferry, to an island where there's a beautiful beach. And the water of the ocean in that beach, I think it's some sea, Mediterranean sea, or that, whatever sea it is, I don't know. <clears throat> we could all cool off by taking bath. So we were on that ferry and we were dreaming of going into cool water of the sea. 